Yo, 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 we live on location, Las Vegas, Nevada, NBA Summer League 2024. We live on location, Black. Eight lounge inside the resort world. <laughs> Eight lounge inside resort world, Las Vegas. We live on location. I got the blackest one with me, and we got a special, special guest today, man. My main man from Tacoma, Washington, Mr. Slow Grind himself, Isaiah Thomas. We appreciate you, man. Man, I appreciate y'all having me. I appreciate it. This is big. Thank you. First of all, bro, man, we appreciate you uh, coming on the show with us, man. Your story from start to finish, man, is inspiring. Like, man, you proved everybody wrong every time, so we can't do nothing but root for you, man, every time you get your opportunity, man. But we really appreciate you being on the show with us, bro. So thank you rocking with us, man. Man, I appreciate it. This is, you know, legendary to be around you too, especially two guys that, you know, I looked up to while I was growing up. So I appreciate it. When you first got to the league, who was the first person to bust your ass? It was Curry, for sure. Duh. Curry Curry was, cause the, and they had that Bay Area little rivalry. Yeah, Sacramento. And, they, and, and when I first got to the league, Curry, the, the Warriors wasn't really good. Like they was kind of on the fence of being good. So like Curry was one was, that was one, that was a tough one. <laughs> but we had our battles, like we had our battles, but yeah, yeah, he got me. He got me a few times until I tried to slowly start figuring it out then my opportunity came more. Yeah, you so that was the it. thing, like he was getting me and I couldn't get back at him. Cause right. I was nah, like, he'd give me a few and then I'm getting subbed out type thing. They don't so, understand that exactly. a person get 20 so, shots and you get five, <laughs> it's gonna always it's over. Yeah. So it once my opportunity job. start coming, I started to get my get back. But yeah, Curry was one of the guys that, that got me early. Tacoma, Washington. So the Isaiah Thomas name came from a bet. <laughs> that your pops lost. Yeah. So it was, it's two sides to the story. So my dad, a big Laker fan, my dad's side of the family's from LA. So brainwashed into being a Laker fan growing up. Um, my dad had a little wager with one of his best friends. If the Pistons beat the Lakers, he had named me Isaiah Thomas. Or Isaiah, it's spelled different because my mom liked the name, but she grew up in church and wanted mm. to spell it the biblical way. Yeah. So it's like two sides to it. like. That's what I that's what I was told when I was growing up. So we luckily I became a basketball player and it, it and it fit. worked out a little bit. So <laughs> it was it was it was a little bit of luck in that. Seattle got a, a rich history of basketball. Like man, some of the best basketball players ever that came out of Seattle. Who was it um when you was coming up that you were seeing that you was like, man, I wanna I wanna be like them. So the first one that I seen was Nate Robinson. Like when I seen him in person, went to a high school game Nate and Daniel. seen him. Nate the Great. Um, and then obviously he was a little dude. Yeah. He could jump out the gym, was electrifying. Um, and someone I really wanted to be like. And then I got to know him growing up. But then like the biggest one, obviously, as you guys know, is Jamal Crawford. Jamal yeah. Crawford, Jason Terry. Young mom. Those are two guys that like really mentored me. Like. I've known Jason Terry since I was a young kid. Yeah, His dad JT. was actually my AAU coach growing up. So yeah. like, I always had a relationship with Jason. Jamal, as I got into high school and in college, we started to form a really good relationship. And that's like one of my best friends to this day. And then, like I said, Nate Robinson was just somebody that I can relate to. Like he was a small guy that, you know, I wanted to try to be like, and, you know, I just tried to take advantage of getting to know him and, and letting his energy rub off on mine, as you know, Nate is is is, is one of a kind. So, um, those are the three guys that really like from the city that really helped me and 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 mentored me into growing into the man I am today. And then like without those guys, I definitely wouldn't have had the career that I I've been able to have. Like, yeah. Being able to be around Jason Terry all the time, seeing his work ethic, being able to be around Jamal Crawford seeing how he treats people and how he, you know, takes yeah. care of his business. And then just being around Nate Robinson and trying to, you know, emulate all the things that he was, you know, so great at. Those guys really would just, you know, pave the way for me. And then like growing up in the era of the Sonics, you yeah. know, Gary Payton and Sean Kemp, yeah, which is crazy. Late. You got the Sean Kemp, yeah, you know, yeah. high school jersey on. So like those guys just watching them from afar and being able to go to Sonics games every now and then, like they made my dream that much more real being able to see, see superstars NBA. in my city and like walking around the city, not just, especially at the level that they were at, like 
you could see them at the corner store and it, 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 it just seemed like that was just normal. You being a smaller player, you can't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Like everything got to count with you. So when you was coming up, who was telling you like, no, nah, you got to make these shots. Mm -hmm. So you can't make these certain mistakes because you're not tall enough or you're yeah. not as big as enough. So you got to you got to think the game out. You got to play a certain way. Who was kind of instilling that in you to um, play that just, way? Just those guys. Oh, you okay. know, those guys. But Damon Stoudemire was a big one for me. Yeah. Like, he was a lefty. He was from Portland, which is close to yeah. Tacoma and Seattle. And somebody that, like, once I got to meet him at a young age, like, that was kind of who I emulated my game after. A lefty that could shoot it. Um, had super handles, was yeah. really quick. Mighty Mouse, man. Yeah, Mighty Mouse. I got a Mighty Mouse tattoo because of him. <laughs> yeah, so like, he was a crazy. big inspiration yeah. to you know my life and my career and someone that would, once I got old enough, especially like going into college, he was a guy that really like, like paved the way and helped me in things that I was searching for. Like, what do I got to do to make it to the NBA as a small guard? And he was a guy that like, you got to be able to knock down shots. You got to be able to, be creative in the paint. You got to be able to be unpredictable. Like yeah. the, that was the first guy that kind of was like giving me the game on how to make it as a small guy. Because yeah. I, I mean, you guys don't know because you guys are a little bigger. It, it's <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, it's tough because you got to be like super special. Like you yeah. got to you got to do things like at a high level that most guys don't have to do. Like yeah. so, I got to be exceptional every time I step on the floor. Exactly. And you know, it's not fair, but that was the that's just the way of life. And that it's was the way, the way of how is. the game is, because as you guys know, it's a big man's game. So it's like, when you do come in as a small guard, you got to do kind of everything perfect. Yeah, you got to think it, right? Like, you got to be, like, obviously you can't be perfect, but you got to be close. Right, yeah. And that's just how my career always has been. I, I take those opportunities and run with them. Like I obviously know it's like damn near impossible to make it as a small guard. So yeah. when I did make it, I was just trying to give the game back to all the little guys like, yeah. and telling them what the things to do, just like a guy like Damon Stoudemire did for me. At what point do you feel like you started to become like good where like people in, in around your area started to notice you. You say it was like, was you early? Cause you, some some dudes be little dynamos with the ball yeah, like yeah, that, but like, it, was you one of those dudes? It so wasn't you early get better in high school? Because when I, when I grew up, I played a year up all the time. Okay, right. And I was a guy that like, well, we my all team was did really, yeah, my then. team back then, that was yeah, just normal. Yeah, that was the judge. And then my team was really good. So I didn't really play a lot. Like I played when we blew somebody out or maybe the game's over on the other end. So when I got to high school, when I got the opportunity in high school, I went to a high school that guys don't usually go to because I knew I would have a chance to just play right away. <laughs> right. When I got to high school, that's when everybody started to realize like what I already knew. Like I already felt like I was good enough. I already felt like I was better than anybody that I played against, whether I played up or not. Then when I got to high school, the city started to like understand that I, I had a little bit of one of them how, how that recognition felt. Exactly, it felt good. It felt <laughs> it felt like finally, like I always knew, but once the city started to recognize it, I was going to my high school games, people trying to take pictures, signing autographs. That's when I realized like I'm a little different. And then obviously down the road, it just started to get bigger and bigger and more people started to have eyes on me. And I just took advantage of every opportunity I got every time I stepped on the floor. You averaged 31 your junior year. Yeah. but. <laughs> Like your senior year, you transferred to Connecticut, like yeah. all the way across uh, the country. I didn't realize you went to South Kent. You know, like, D. Wright went to that D. school. D. Wright went to yeah. South. He's the first player. I didn't know he here. went there. Yeah. yeah. What made you go from average 31 to just, I mean, I'm going to go across the country and, and I, play? I didn't want to. It was, I had to get my academics in order. So mm -hmm. my junior year of high school, I committed to the University of Washington. Once I went to my senior year of high school, I remember the, the um, coaching staff hit me like, we got to make a move. Like it was already always on the radar a little bit, but he's like, we got to make a move to get your, your grades in order so you can accept the scholarship. So it was a move that I had to make quick and they kind of already had the connection out in Connecticut yeah. with the coach out there, there who, I, who worked for um, Nike, Rafael Chilius. And it was something I had to do right on the spot. It's something I didn't want to do. Yeah. I wasn't trying, like, I was kind of a local celebrity back at the crib. Right, so, like, right. I had my homies that. at the crib. I had my little fan base. Like you said, I just averaged 31, yeah. coming off a year averaging 31. So at 16, I'm like, I'm not trying to dip the crib, but 
I knew if I didn't, that was gonna mess up my ultimate goal of trying to get to the NBA. Yeah. Because obviously you can't go out of high school no more like you did. Yeah. And you had to go to college. So it was something that had to happen right away. UW had the connection out in South Kent, out in Connecticut, the middle of nowhere, <laughs> to where it was an all boys school. You had to wear a suit and tie every day. So it was something that was like, not just a culture shock for me, coming from the inner city and going out there, but it was something like, everything was different. Right. Everything yeah. was different, but it was, it was something that I had to do and I had to take a step from being a 16 year old kid back at the crib to being a 16 year old young man. And I had to take care of my responsibilities. Cause I know if I didn't do this, there's no NBA, there's no going to college. So it was a quick, quick decision we had to make. I had to do two years there. So I did a, a prep year too. I did a post-grad year. It was a blessing in disguise for me. It was the best decision I ever made. Like obviously I had to do it at that point, but it really helped me once I got to college. It helped me grow into a young man that I am. It helped me learn how to take care of my responsibilities on Be my own. Be professional. Because I was 16, I, I went away from my parents. I that's, went away from my homies. Ill. Yeah. And the crazy thing, the fast forward, so my when I graduated from South Kent, my, that was the first time, graduation day was the first time my parents came on oh, campus. Okay. So they just, they, they sent me somewhere. They didn't really know where to, they were well, sending me, but yeah. it was somewhere I had to go. My mom came on campus, she started crying right when she, right when she got on campus, cause it was just, it was different. Yeah. It was in the middle of nowhere. I think it was like, my graduation class was like 110 kids. Mm -hmm. Small, small, it's like six to eight people classrooms. Like it was just yeah, different from great. where we came from, but it was something I had to do. And it was something that when I look back at it now, it was the best decision of my life. It, it grew me into a young man and it's like, the competition was way better. Like that was the best competition. I was playing against guys like Michael Beasley, OJ Mayo, like all those guys that were like big names in high school. Like I was playing against those guys. So it, it definitely made my transition easier to go into college, but that was the toughest shit I ever had to go through. How does that make you like now? You say you got kids, you be on their ass about academics. Now, oh, I be. <laughs> you don't want to do what I had to do. Like, you don't want to have to go across the country, the yeah. middle of nowhere, leave your homies, leave your family to have to go do that. Just take care of it now. So I always try to chop game to them about that because it's like you control that. But my dad and my parents was on me about that, and I was just, I was one of them kids that was thinking like. I was so good at hoop, like I'm it was, it was just gonna figure it was gonna yeah. figure itself out. Right. And it almost, you know, it almost bit me in the ass for sure. Could it have been anybody else who almost got you away from Washington? Or it was just etched in stone that it was just Washington and nobody else? Nah, nah. I wanted I wanted to go other places for sure. It was cause it's crazy because I was gonna follow in the footsteps of the older Isaiah Thomas. I was gonna go to Indiana. That was my first scholarship offer. Mm. So I was gonna commit during my junior year. Then my dad like, let's just wait a little bit. And I waited, that coach got fired two months later. Yeah. So then once I didn't go to Indiana, I was like, shit, I might as well stay at the crib. Nate Robinson got it cracking, Brandon yeah. Roy got it cracking. Like yeah. it looked like it was jumping. They were the number one seed that year too. So it was jumping, but then Fast forward, when I get to prep school, all the East Coast schools start to be on me. That's what I was So it was say. like hey. UConn came on me, Kentucky, all those. So it was, I wanted to experience that as well. So there were so many times that I was really about to decommit from UW. Yeah. And then Coach Romar and Coach Cameron Dollar. So was Romar just, was still there. Yeah, right? Romar was there. So yeah. they, they did their job of keeping me. And those two years that I did at prep school felt like I was away from college. So when I had to do those two years, I was like, man, I'm ready to get back home. Missed, like, yeah, I want to, I want to go back to the crib. Yeah. I want to be around my friends and my family. And that was a big decision why I stayed, you know, stay loyal to going to UW. Let me tell you a story about Romar. Uh, Romar used to be the coach for St. Louis. St. Louis, U yeah. Before he went to Washington, so I went on a visit to St. Louis U because you know how Romar and Romar are real cool. <laughs> cool. So I'm at the visit, we in the gym, and uh, we standing under the gold, and he he come and do a layup. He, and he like, man, you think you can block this layup? And I'm like, man, I tossed that shit like in the third <laughs> row. So he said, let's see. So he, he stepped back, come for the layup. He tried to dunk on oh, me yeah, yeah. and <laughs> missed it. Yeah, yeah. I was so happy oh, that he man. missed it. I was like, man, I'm glad you, you missed it. I used to, I used to hear you stories about Romar trying to get dude. Oh, my God. he don't look like he got game. And he lefty and yeah, can shoot. Yeah, I, yeah. I barely jumped because I'm just going to toss this shit, man. He, oh, he tried to sneak He came in slow. Yeah. That boy hit that boom, boom. Uh, he tried to <laughs> I said, ooh. Oh. I said, he almost dunked on me, man. Romar a good dude, man. 
great dude. One of yeah. my favorite people. Yeah. yeah. Hey, tell me this. How how dope was it? Like you said, you grew up wanting to play and be like Nate. How dope was it for you to get the blessing at, at, at UW to wear the number the number two? Oh, the dopest thing ever. Like once I started at that age, I started to become really close with Nate Rob. So like when I went to UW, I didn't know what number I would, wanted to do because in high school I was always number eleven after Isaiah Thomas. And when I got there, there was a guy already wearing 11. He wasn't trying to give it up. So Nate, <laughs> I remember Nate calling me one day. He was like, bro, why don't you just wear it? Why don't you just wear number two? I'm like, you know, that was your, your stuff. I don't know about wearing number two. And then he just kind of forced me to wear number two. And it was, it was, it was dope because I really wanted to be like Nate Robinson all the time. Like I was somebody that obviously, like I said, I looked up to. So when he blessed me to wear number two, it was like, it gave me extra motivation. Like I got to take out of the footsteps of Nate Rob. Like, and that was big because Nate Rob was. He was that, that dude. He's the great. He's the great in our city. Like real shit. We we call Nate the great. We call him the great. And Nate is someone that is like, is one of the obviously you know that was a former teammate of yours. He's someone that I really look up to and really paved the way for me and really helped me throughout my whole career for sure. Was you surprised of? of the success you had just right away in college? Cause you know, it's another level mm -hmm. up now. Did you, was you surprised of how successful you were? Um, I wasn't surprised. Cause like I said, prep school really prepared me. Like mm -hmm. I was really playing against older guys already, guys that should have been in college, post-grad guys. And some of the best talent in the prep school league. So when I got to college, I felt like I was more ready than a regular freshman. Mm -hmm. And then Romar gave me the, the opportunity to just Take come in and really light. do my thing. So like, <laughs> The guys respected me coming in, the older guys respected me, and I was just coming in trying to really take, bring the program back to where Nate, B-Roy, Trey Simmons, Will Conroy, those guys yeah. had it. And I just came in with that hometown swag and I always had that confidence in myself and that belief in myself that I was the best player in college. Like I always felt like that individually. So when I got the opportunity, it was like, I just got to take advantage of it. And Romar gave me, laid out the, the opportunity for me. My teammates really rallied around me and then gave me like the opportunity to really go to work. And I was able to, you know, come in and win right away. Like we won the first first Pac-10 outright title in like 53 years yeah. in UW. And I was able to, to win Pac-10 freshman of the year. Yeah. So it was yeah. like, how dope was that at the crib, though? It was dope. You've like, you been gone for two uh, years. Two you years, back to the crib. And you everybody's got excited about me coming back. And then, like, all my homies is in the crowd. Right. Like, it, was, it just felt like high school again. It felt like high school. So it was, it was definitely a surreal and a dope feeling. And then, like I said, we started winning again. And it felt like when I used to go to the games and watch Nate Rob, when I used to go to the games and watch B-Roy, like, it felt like that energy. So it was... It was definitely a dope feeling, and to do it at the crib was was really cool. To get freshman of the year, then your sophomore year, you get first team, all pack 10. Then your junior year, you you get a first team, all pack 10, but you hit the buzzer beater. Tell us about the buzzer beater <laughs> in the tournament. <laughs> Look, you... the buzzer beater was crazy because it was in Staples Center. So like, yeah. that's where like my idol is Kobe Bryant. The whole time that possession, the fast four to that possession, when coach let me go four flat, I'm thinking, oh, I'm doing Kobe. Like I'm, I'm, I'm in the game winner like Kobe would. Um, but the 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 game winner was like, people still, especially at home, still talk about it to this day. It was a cool game winner. I think the the best thing about it was Gus Johnson. Gus Johnson calling the game. Yeah. Like he made it. Hype. He made it to what it really was. Like the shot was really cool. But like, if you listen to it, like he made it, he, he called crazy. me Young Zeke. Like he was like <laughs> a homie at the crib. Like it was a really dope experience to be a part of. I always dreamed of hitting a game winner on national TV. Mm -hmm. um, it was the Pac-10 championship game, the last year of the Pac-10 as well. So it was definitely one of the moments you dream of. And it's funny because when I hit the shot and like that night, I kind of knew I was going to the league. Like I was like, man, I'm not. I'm putting my name in the draft after that. Like, <laughs> other than winning the national championship, I, my, my stock wasn't really going to go no higher. So yeah. I was like, it might be a wrap. It might be a wrap. So that was, <laughs> that, was a, that was a good little moment. And I always, you know, look back on those moments because, like, college was the best time of my life. Like, yeah. I still have those. Some of my closest friends are from my college team. So What was the conversation with Romo when you told him you decided you want to – Skip your senior and, and, and get on out so of So Romar, at first he was like, you sure? Cause like he wasn't hearing like I was gonna be a first round pick. He wasn't yeah. hearing none of that. So he was like, I'm gonna go see what I'm hearing. 
and then I'll give Come you the back. feedback. Yeah. I was like, okay. When he came back, he's like, I think it would be best for you to stay another year. Mm -hmm. And then it's crazy because he's like, you know, if you stay another year, you can be the all-time leading scorer in UW history. You could be the all-time leading assist leader in UW history. You can be first team all all American. He was laying all of it out. And it sounded dope, but it was like, I remember when I told him, I said, honestly, my goal was never to be the number one leading scorer in college or in UW history. My my goal wasn't to be the assist leader. Like, my goal was to use this to try to get to the league. Yeah. And when I told him that, and Romar's always been real with me, like oh, since man. day one, the most authentic coach I've ever been around. When I told him that, he looked and smiled. He's like, all right, I'm riding with you. So you want to make that decision? I'll be here every morning to help you out and figure out how we're going to make this happen. Yeah. And he was there every morning. I went every morning at 6 a.m. at UW, worked out with a trainer, and he was there every morning sitting down and just evaluating and watching. Yeah. And Romar is one of my biggest supporters. And, you know, without him, I definitely wouldn't be in the position I am in today. I definitely wouldn't have the career I have, I've had um, in the NBA and in college. And like I said, he's one of the most, like the, the realest coaches that I've ever been around now. I always give my flowers to Coach Rowe for sure. Shout out Coach Romar. For real. How was your um, your draft process? Like how many teams did you work out for? Oh, I, I probably worked out for like 18 teams. Mm, see? <laughs> so it was it was a lot because- Kendrick Spears here. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, and I wasn't like, you know, for sure first round pick. Like yeah. I was hearing like, I was, I was beginning of the second round, middle of the second round. I remember I had a workout with the Bulls. They had two picks, the 28th and 30th in the end of the first round. And that was one of my best workouts. And they said, if you're around, we might, and we're looking for a guard, we might, we might take you into consideration. So that was one of my first round um, opportunities. And then when that pick went by, it was like, I knew I wasn't a first round pick. You didn't obviously. get discouraged here in the like second round or not guaranteeing? Yeah, because my goal was always to go to the NBA. So like, I was, I was cool with going back to college, but it was like, what am I doing it for? That's not my goal. Yeah, like, but I'm talking about, but you hearing second round, cause you know second round is not guaranteed no that you're you on the team. I was just like, I'm a bet on myself. When I hit that shot in college and I we went to the NCAA tournament three times, I won three Pac-10 championships. Like realistically, I wasn't, I don't think we was gonna really win a national championship. And that will probably have raised my stock just a little more. Yeah. Cause you gotta realize I'm 5'9 too. Like yeah. there ain't too much more I can do. And I was, I was doing a lot in college. So for my stock to be where it was, it was like, realistically, it's not gonna get any higher. Yeah, so when it. I talked to the guys that, you know, that was mentors to me, Damon Stoudemire, Gary Payne at that time, Jamal Crawford, Jason Terry, they set out a formula for me and I, and I went by it every day. I trained mm -hmm. every day. I trained two to three times a day. And I really just bet on myself. I said, if I get the opportunity, I know what I'm gonna do with it. So I went in there, I worked out for 18, 20 teams. I served every workout. I dominated every workout. Like I didn't just beat these guys out. I dominated every workout. I was the best, best player yeah, in every, every workout. I was the most prepared in every workout. Jason Terry was going through the NBA playoffs. That's the year they won the championship in Dallas. I lived in Dallas for two months. Every time he had the chance, we used to wake up at six in the morning. I was on the track. I was in the, I was in the, um, the gym twice a day. So I was prepared, I already knew. Once I got to the draft, I really thought I was gonna be like an early second round pick. Mm -hmm. So that's why I really kept my name in the draft. I was like, if I could be a second round pick, I can get to training camp. I, actually, I was like, I can get to summer league. And it, it's crazy because we had a lockout that year. Mm -hmm. So everything was stacked against <laughs> me. I didn't have summer league to showcase nothing. Mm -hmm. I didn't, the Kings ended up picking me with the last pick. How did you do your draft? Did you just have a, have a get together at the crib, like a party or something? Or did yeah, you I had go a get together. So I had a little draft party with my family and my close friends. And it's crazy because I was at the University of Washington with all my UW teammates. Watch, we wasn't really watching the draft. We was just on the court, just shooting around, shooting the shit and trying to get my mind off the draft. My friends and my family was out of the apartment complex because we had a little get together. So I remember that was the longest day of my life. The longest day of my life. I was really the last pick in the draft. Like, that's Did you give up? Tell, Did tell. you give up in your At mind? At one you point, heard, cause look, right. when the Bulls went by the 28th and 30th pick, I'm like, okay, the Lakers have four picks in the second round. Yeah. And they needed guards. And they told me if you're if you're there at that point, we taking guards. Yeah. And I had a really good workout. They took, I think, two guards. 
one guard played maybe that first season, the other guard never even had an NBA game. Mm -hmm. So once those picks were done, I think their last pick was like 54. Once that was done, that's when I started to think like, damn, I might not. We're going to have to figure this out. Like, I might not get, get drafted. Picked, yeah. I remember my mom calling me. She's like, are you good? Are you all right? I'm like, I mean, I'm okay. Right. I remember and she said, remember, she read a scripture out. It was like, the first shall be last and the last, last shall, shall be, be first. first. Yeah. One of the scriptures in the Bible. And at that point, I'm listening, but I'm like, I'm like, damn, did I make the wrong decision? Because at that point, it was like towards the end of the draft. I remember at the 58th pick, I end up leaving the gym because I'm, I'm going to head back to the apartment because the, the drive about to be over. So I'm like, I'm going to just head back to the apartment and see what was, what's happening over there. My agent calls me right when I get to the apartment. He's like, the Kings. I forgot I even, my first workout was the Kings. I forgot mm -hmm. I even worked out with the Kings. Right. He like, the Kings are going to pick you with the last pick. That was like the best news I ever, like, my, my goal going into the draft, I said, whether I get picked first or last, like, mm -hmm. I just want to hear my name called. At the end of the day, I just wanted to hear my name called. That's been a goal of mine my whole life. And when he called me and told me that, it's crazy. It was like a movie. I walk, my parents don't even know yet. So I walk in at like the 59th pick. Mm. Right when the Sixers said, with the 60th pick, the Sacramento Kings, and they didn't even know. They, they over there kind of sad because they're not even knowing that, and the draft's almost over. It said, Adam Silver said, the King select Isaiah Thomas, and everybody just start tripping. And I knew like a couple minutes before, but it was like a blessing in disguise. Just it to was, see that moment It of was him. like everything I dreamed of. Like, yeah. I didn't even care if it was the last pick at that right. point. Yeah. And then you know how they do, they call you after. The Kings yeah. called me. <laughs> they was excited. I didn't know what was going to happen. They was excited. They like, we can't wait to see you. We can't wait to have you here. We think we got a steal in the drive. And, once they were saying all that, then I was like, okay, I got a chance. Like, this is this is all I asked for. Right. This was all I asked for. So it turned into the longest day of my life, but like one of the best days of my life at the same time, even though I was the last pick in the draft. You recorded a documentary series. Mm -hmm. Then, and I know you probably looked back on it since then, but how was that to record your every movement for this road to that? It was everything because during that draft process, I had a guy who's one of my close friends to this day. His name is TJ. We actually have a production company together called Slow Grind Media. So, um, cause we want to do a movie when it's done. And mm -hmm. we've been filming since 2010. So yeah. I, I got I got all that footage since 2010. So I wanted to really, cause I know a lot of guys got my type of story mm -hmm. and like back against the wall, against all odds type of story. So I wanted to document that. And then when we put it out, that was one of the best little docu-series that Definitely we ever was. done. Yeah. And it, it like inspired so many people. Like I go around to this day and people be like, man, I be watching that book of Isaiah. That's what we named it. We, I be I watching it. the book of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Man, that was a crazy time in my life. And that's what we did it for. So then like my story relates to so many guys out there trying to make their dream come true. I wanted to be as real as possible and showing like not just the good part of my story, but the difficult parts as well. When you started playing, how did you approach it? Because you won Western Conference Rookie of the Month twice, being a 60th pick. Crazy. Like, how did you approach like them practices and? So at first, I w I wasn't playing at all. Like my my rest in peace. My first coach was Paul Westfall. Like, they said I was on the team, but like he didn't say I was gonna get a chance or anything. So right. in practice, which is crazy, my the, I think the seventh pick in that draft was Jimmer Fredette. And then another guy, rest in peace, Tyler Honeycutt, was an early second round pick. So going into the training camp, I was just like, I'm gonna pick guys up full court. I'm gonna outwork guys. I'm gonna be the first, like literally, I'll be the first guy here, the last guy to leave. I didn't, at that point, I had, I had my oldest son. So I didn't have like crazy responsibilities, but I had a lot of time on my hands. So I was always in the gym. I was really, I was at Jimmer for day every day. <laughs> like, <laughs> so and I got all respect for Jimmer. Yeah, nothing to do with every, him. It, it didn't have like, nothing to do with him. He was just in the way with what I was trying to do. Yeah, I was at his ass every day. Then we had Tyreek Evans too. So I was, Tyreke, yeah. I was just trying to figure out how to stay alive. So I, and all I knew was I'm gonna outwork these dudes, and I'm gonna just be a killer. Like, every day I'm gonna be here. So at that point, I was there every day. I didn't play the first probably 10, 15 games. Like when I did get in, it would be like 
were down 25 with the last two minutes of the mm -hmm. game. So right. I just showcased that I belonged every chance I got. And then I remember Paul Westfall gets fired. Keith Smart comes in. Keith, Coach Smart. Keith Smart. Yeah. He's playing me a little bit more. And then one day we in Detroit. He comes to me in the morning before shoot around. He's like, he's like, I want to meet with you. So we meet before shoot around. He's like, IT, I'm a I'm thinking about starting you. I'm not even knowing this is about to happen. Right. Like, he's he's like, like, he like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm over here trying to become. I'm like, starting me. He said, I'm thinking about starting you, but I'm gonna tell you one thing. He's like, if you don't do your thing, that's your ass and my ass. I was <laughs> like, I was like, say no more. So Nate, late, he said he's thinking about starting me. So we go to shoot around. I'm not in the starting lineup yet. We meet before the game when we get in the locker room. He's like, I'm gonna pull the plug. I'm gonna start you. Just go out there and make shit happen. And I'm like, I got you. That game, I think I had a solid game. I had like 14 and seven. I think we win. I play a lot. The next game we play Kyrie Irving. So it's the first pick, the last pick. I had 23, 12, and nine. That second game, this is my second starting game. And then after that, it was all she wrote. So you said the two player of the months, I start playing and that's all I needed. Once I was able to see a little bit of success and I knew I was getting like 25 to 30 minutes, Y'all know, once you get that yeah. and you know where your shots Time, is coming yeah. from and your time is coming, it was like I was already prepared for those moments. So when I got the opportunity, I never looked back. Like, I started the rest of that year. I, I, think, I think the last, like, 30 games, like you said, I got player of the month. I end up getting, I think, second team all. Second team all, all rookie. rookie. Did you ever look at it like, this is crazy? Yeah, there was times where, In like. your own mind? I always these things but for it to happen in real time like I would sit back sometimes and just be smiling like Cause like the go to six, be the 60th pick then you know you you get there and you got like you said yeah. Tyreek, and I had no summer Jimmy league I had Tyreek is coming off rookie of the year 25 and 5 right. like him and LeBron's the only guys doing that Marcus Thornton just got his little deal so mm -hmm. he's playing and it's a young team you know how that is like I'm not about to be playing over it. I really just, like, when he started me, we moved Tyreek to the two guard, and then I just start playing. And then after that happened, it was like, I knew I belonged. I, like, I knew I can play in the NBA. And then the success that was coming, it was just, I was prepared for it. You the shortest player in NBA history to record a, a triple double. Yeah, that's crazy. Tell that's us about crazy. that game, how you was like, <laughs> feeling that like it was 24, 11, and 10. Yeah, that was against the Wizards. I remember that game. I remember that game. Um, I never thought, that's one thing I never thought I would ever do is a triple-double. Like, I never thought, first, I would get enough rebounds. Yeah, the triple -double. Double. That was the biggest thing. Like, I was always cool with maybe getting close to a double-double or getting a double-double. But the triple-double was like, when I had the rebounds, I think I had 11 rebounds or 10 rebounds. It was something yeah, like that. Yeah, 10 rebounds. Players on my team was hyping me, like, go get the rebound, go get the rebound. Uh, the, um to get the triple double. So when I when I was able to accomplish that, that was one of the my, you know, special accomplishments in my in my career, just because I don't think another short guy is gonna get a triple double. So mm -hmm. I can always say, you know, I'm one of I'm the shortest guy to get a triple double. So that was something that that was really cool for me and definitely was a surprise. That was something that was ne not on my radar ever. When you're going back to the crib, I know you you worked all the way to get it, but now you're going back to the crib. You averaging a dub and six points <laughs> in the league, small guard. Like, the guys you come up with, I know, you know, when you go back to the crib and, and guys see, like, man, you starting in the league? In the league. You averaging a dub? <laughs> in the league. Like, like, how was that? You know, the craziest thing for my situation is, like, everybody back at the crib, like, since I was a little boy, expects me to go get 20 to 25. That's just what I've always done. So like mm -hmm. when I was able to start doing that in the league and when I went back home, it wasn't even no surprise for my closest homies. It wasn't even a surprise for the people in my city of Tacoma. Mm -hmm. They was really like on some about time. Like, they, like right. they're like, cause yeah. they never seen nothing else from me. From They've me. never seen like, whether it be high school, college, I was always kind of able to do my thing. And the scoring's always been my thing. So when I was able to get the opportunity in, in the NBA, like it was just like another day at the office. I, I got my time, I got my opportunity, and I had a coach that believed in me. Like, so when I was able to average a dub, obviously I was 
I would sit back at the crib like, damn, I'm averaging 20 in the league. I really believed I can do it, but I never thought it was going to really happen. So when I did that, that was just like another crazy moment in my career. Like I had so many of them crazy, yeah. like pinch me moments that like they just became normal to me. Like I just wanted a little more. Like when I averaged 20, I'm like, dang, I think I can average 25. 25. And then, you know and then when I averaged, I, I remember like a couple years after that, I averaged 23 with, the, with the, my first year with the Celtic. Then that summer, I'm like, damn, I think I can average 30. Like I was, <laughs> yeah. I, I was always. It's only wanting. two or three more shots. Made. Yeah, like I, I was always breaking the game down like that. How did you handle the sign and trade? Like you, you because you when this... I when I went to when I went to the Suns when I had my little recruiting pitch to the Suns, they catered to me. So like they they got me. It was like a college visit. It was like one of them college visits. They yeah. said all the right stuff. I wanted to be there. Like Phoenix, I thought was a good little situation for me. So, but the the thing we had to do was the sign and trade. So that was that was yeah, the thing. But, but how did it feel to be the six year pick, finally get a chance to play with the King, and a whole nother organization want want talking to you and want you to come over here and play? Crazy, because nobody <laughs> thought like the six year pick. Like I said earlier, I didn't even have a summer league. Usually, that's the time where I can showcase that yeah. I'm good enough. I didn't have no summer league. The lockout, the lockout lasted into December, so I had no real chance to, to really get in the league. So, fast forward three years later, I'm really signing a free, a free agent deal on the first day of uh, first or second day of free agency. Like that was crazy to think about. Like I, that wasn't even on my radar. So, to to be able to accomplish that, that just showed like I stayed down to 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 what I always envisioned that I can do. And then to have another organization really want me to come in and sign and be a piece of what they got going on, it was like, that was like another welcome to the NBA moment. Like yeah. that was my first time that somebody really like wanted me for who I am. Cause you know how it is like being small, they kind of put you in a box. Yes. They don't want you to score too much. They don't want you to. So it was like, I was always fighting that uphill battle of like, Oh, he's just a small, another small guy that likes to score. Like yeah. you know, that that's just the jacket they put on you. So I, it was yeah. an uphill battle, always fighting that. They do that with every single guy. Like every single guy. He's just a shooter, or he just played yeah. defense, or he's just a small guy that play this way, or he a big guy that do this. I don't know why they do that all the time. So they put tough. you in a box and they try to, <laughs> and they do it for the rest of your career. Oh yeah, it's not just a, a moment nah. that they put you in that box. Once they put you in that box, it's like you gotta figure out you how gotta to be fight the best to get in that out of box. it. Yeah, I'm trying to get out of it. Yeah. How was it after you know what I'm saying like getting to going to Phoenix somewhere you wanted to be, you thought they wanted to be? How was it when you found out you getting traded to the Celtics? So that was tough because. In Phoenix, I just signed a four-year deal. I'm thinking, exactly. like, I'm not thinking I'm getting traded the first year. So come All-Star break, we're around the trade deadline. I just do the little skills challenge, too. I'm in the little skills challenge right. with my Phoenix jersey on, thinking I'm going to be there at least the rest of the year. We're in playoff race, everything. I think we was, like, the sixth or seventh seed at that point. Goran Dragic demands a, he demands a trade, so we already know at the trade deadline he's trying to get traded. Craziest thing, I'm going to break down the whole story to you. We're about to leave the Minnesota. So in Phoenix, we're on the team bus waiting for the trade deadline to go, like waiting whatever, three o'clock. Oh, it's one of them. It's one of them. Because we know one player is about to dip. He demanded yeah. a trade. They're kind of beefing. Um, so we wait. He ends up getting traded, getting traded to Miami. So once we make that trade, everybody's like, okay, this is the squad we got. And the deadline just passed. It's like a minute or two past the deadline. My agent hits me before the deadline and is like, there's like, maybe a 10% chance you might be in a deal. But that's, I don't think it's gonna happen. And once the, the time went by, I'm like, oh, I'm cool. We're yeah. on the back of the bus, the, the whole team. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, it's good. This is the team we rocking with the rest of the way. I remember Brandon Wright, left hand big. He like, IT, he look at his phone, he's like, IT, you just got traded. I'm like, no, I didn't. He look, he showed me the phone. It's like on a little ESPN little clip. Traded to the Boston Celtics. I'm thinking, First off, I'm thinking, I'm finally on a playoff team. I've been on a losing team for three years. I'm finally on a playoff team. Boston just traded Rondo like a month ago. They don't got their big three. Like, it, it caught me by surprise. I was hot. Crazy thing is, first person who calls me, the older Isaiah Thomas, he like, I know you probably emotional. You got a lot of things going on right now, but this is gonna be the best move of your career. I'm not even thinking Zeke that. Called yeah, Zeke called me. I'm like, and he told me, he's like, I'm telling you, this is going to be the best 
thing that happened to your career. At that point, I'm not even seeing where he's coming from. I'm like, Boston, it's cold. I don't even own a coat at that time. It's it's right. February. I'm going to the I'm going to practice like this. It's yeah. 80 degrees. Phoenix. I'm thinking yeah, about Boston. Phoenix they and Sacramento. Yeah, you don't even need Boston all that. <laughs> they in rebuild mode. They not that good at that point. And it's cold. So when he breaks that down to me, I'm like, yeah, I mean, I can see it, but I don't know what they're thinking. So Danny Ainge calls me. He's excited. He's like, man, welcome to the squad. We're excited to get you. We've been looking for a player like you. We don't got that on this team. So it was that was my first time really being traded. Obviously, the signing trade happened with the Phoenix yeah, Suns, but yeah. it was tough. I didn't think it was going to be a good opportunity or a good situation. I thought it was going to be a good opportunity because they didn't really have any solidified players. They was going through rebuild mode. So I was thinking, damn, I'm going to come in and play again. But like, it's not going to be winning basketball, which I was trying to go towards that in my career. I didn't know what to expect with Boston, but obviously fast forward, it was kind of one of the best situations for me. And yeah. it was a um, good situation because it was a team that wanted me for who I was and allowed me to be who I was. And it was a team that I needed somebody to allow me to, to, to believe in me and who I was at being a 5'9 scoring guard, which is basically unheard of in the NBA, so. I did a training camp with Boston. I ain't never get a chance to really get, I got cut or whatever. But uh, the two months I was there, being on a being in an organization like that, when I'd been to a different organization, seeing the banners oh, in, yeah. in the practice facility, the arena, like the aura of the Boston Celtics organization, how did that feel? And did you feel the same thing that I was feeling when? Yeah. When, when I, you, you feel that right when you walk in. Yeah. You see all the pictures of all the greats, you see the banners. It's a different energy in Boston. Like, right? Like, even when I used to play against Boston, like it's cool, you know the arena's cold. Like you really yeah. ain't, you really ain't tripping on playing against the Celtics like yeah. that. Especially at that time, they wasn't as good. But like when I got traded there and put on a Boston uniform, it changed everything. Like mm -hmm. you're expected to be great. You're expected to win championships. You see Bill Russell around. You see Bill Walton. Rest in peace to all them. Yeah. You see all the greatness in Boston. You feel it in the air. You feel it. Yeah. It, it. It's an energy changer. Like you. It's like greatness in the air. Then don't piggyback, don't, don't. Like you got the Patriots over there that's winning Super Bowls. Right, you got yeah. the Boss, you got the Bruins the over Bruins, there winning Super yeah. Bowl. Like it's in the city to be great. So like that feeling, that definitely was a different feeling than when I was in Sacramento, when I was in Phoenix, and any other feeling I had around any other organization. It was yeah. like, it was like you gotta be great now. They're not satisfied with going to the first round. They're not satisfied with having a little regular season success. They trying to put a banner up. How was it for you when you started to like when you started getting busy over there? And like how did how did that compare to like you say that fan base and the way that they recognize they they players and stars? Like, how did that feel walking around that type of city as opposed to being in Sacramento uh, and Phoenix and everything else? Like when you started to win and y'all started to win. Yeah, as no, a team? no, no, nothing against those other franchises either. Like, there's no comparison. I bet I bet the Knicks is comparison. Like you know how you go away game and you you was on the Knicks. You know how you go to the away game, it's all blue and orange in yeah. there. You go to a Boston game, I mean you go to a game, away game, it's all green in there. Like it's the feeling playing for the Celtics is amazing. Like, and then the love you get. The love is like the love that I get to this day, you would think I won a championship there. You would think I had a 10 year career there. Like you would think my my jersey is retired in them stands. Yeah, they yeah. so love. The love that they give me. And the love that I got there from day one, like you said, is just different. Like obviously I put my career on the line for those guys and the city seen that. So like I got real genuine love for Boston. I think it's the same for sure. That 2016-17 season, you averaged 28. You got the longest consecutive 20, 20 point games in 43. Y'all was the number one seed. I go all the way to the to the uh, conference final. You tied your career high that year. All-star game, you know, reserve, like, just explain like that. That season was crazy because the season before, I, I think I averaged like 22 and a half. Like I had a good year, that was my first all-star year. That's when I started to realize like, I'm one of them players. Like I'm, I'm one of them players. I started to visualize all that stuff. I started to connect with the great players. That's, that's at the time where I started to build a relationship with Kobe Bryant build a friendship with Tom Brady. 
I was super close with Floyd Mayweather. So like I was trying to surround myself with greatness. greatness like I seen yeah. where my career was going. Allen Iverson was a big mentor of mine. So like that summer, when I really chopped it up with AI and he was like, man, you're just like me. You're a killer. That changed everything for me. Like mentally, I went to a different level. I remember documenting one thing. I'm like, man, Allen Iverson averaged for a career 26 points a game. Like that season I just had is not good enough. Like I got to do a little more. I remember going into it, I like my goal. I wrote, I, I write down my goals every year. My goal was to average 25 that year. They gave me the opportunity. I was the first year of my career I didn't have to look over my shoulder. Like the first year that- You had to look at the coach coming down. I didn't have to do anything. Like yeah. they gave me the green light. I was the franchise guy. It, it just reminded me of high school, like where I knew I was gonna get 30 to 35 every night. Yeah. Like mentally I figured the game out. So I like when you said earlier, like two or three extra shots gonna get you two, six to eight yeah. extra points. Like I figured the game out to a T. So when I was able to have that opportunity that year, every night I knew I was getting 30. Yeah. I knew it because I just figured it out. I figured the game out inside and out. I watched film every day. I prepared. I prepared on some Kobe shit, like I really did. And he was able to mentor me and like really mold me all year. Like I used to call Kobe at night. Like, what do I do when they're defending me like this? We used to watch film. Like really, like he used to really take his time and watch film with me. And it was like, my skills were all, all always there. My mental just took it to a different level. And that's how I was able to have that success. And obviously my, my teammates, allowed me to be who I was. My coaching staff, Brad Stevens, put me in position to be who I was, and they embraced that. Like, like I said earlier, when I got traded to Boston, it was a team that needed a guy like me, and I needed a team to give me a chance like that, and they did. And every year, I just got a little better. Every year, I was just a little more paranoid to, to get closer to greatness. When I went into that year, my goal was to average 25, and I just kept exceeding that. And when I seen that success, no disrespect to anybody else that I played against that year, but no other guard would even look me in my eye because they knew what it was. Like, it didn't matter. It didn't matter who it was, the best of the best. They know you was coming. They knew I was coming. Not saying I was going to win that battle that night, but they knew a 30-piece was coming. Yeah. For sure they did. And I seen <laughs> it and I felt it. And I know that type of, that's why, like, I be telling young guys to this day, like, if you ever get that opportunity to be in that space and to have the opportunity to be a franchise guy, Stay in that space as long as you can, because that shit go like this. When you heard you was an all-star reserve. I should have been a starter that year, though. Yeah, you heard you was an all-star <laughs> reserve. That's how much I was trying to take for everybody. Like, go ahead, but I should have been a starter for sure. <laughs> and you walk in that locker room, and you see the best of the best. You see the, your last name on the back of that all-star jersey. Like, just explain that weekend for you in general. I rewind to my first all-star year. So the first all-star year, 2016, was Kobe's last all-star year. So that was a crazy experience itself. My favorite player ever going out his last all-star year, my first. So that year I was going into it like trying to just, like I was enjoying the whole thing. Like I was seeing all the best players that I looked up to, Dwayne Wade, LeBron, guys that I obviously battle against, but to be a part of that weekend, like I'm there, like I'm one of the 24 or however many players, I'm one of the 24 best players in the world. Like nobody can take that from me. So fast forward to my second All-Star year where I'm averaging 30. At that point, I think I'm averaging 32. That year, the energy was different. I'm walking into them rooms, they're, they're, they're dapping me up different. They're like, <laughs> oh, he's one of them ones. Like the first year, they're like, congratulations, you made it. Like the first time All-Star thing, like you know how that, like, oh, uh, he made it, he snuck in here. Like I could feel that energy. The second one, they dabbed me up like I'm one of them. Like right. they are welcome oh, again. Like LeBron's dabbing me up, like everybody. It's that mutual respect, like, oh yeah, he's he's really made it. Like he's one of us. So that all-star year was different. That was that was amazing to to just get get that respect from your peers, as you guys know, that means the most. To have that respect from your peers that you're really one. It went from being like the 24 best. I felt like I was like top five <laughs> at, yeah. at that point. You know, not 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 to sound cocky or anything. That's just how I really felt. And I felt like those other guys felt that same way that year. So it was it was a dope moment. It was a dope opportunity. Like I cherish those moments because those are the, some of the best moments of my life. Being named an all-star in the NBA where 
Nobody thought that that was going to come. Nobody did. And I think I scored 20 points that game, so that was a good little that was a good little cherry on top for sure. The next year, you won a five players to drop 50 in the playoffs yeah. as a Celtic. Like, I, I remember that game, like, like how the crowd was mm -hmm. just into it and just so hype and how you just feeling yourself in the. So that game was crazy because, as you guys know, my sister, my little sister passed away like a month before that. So tragic, tragic car accident. So I was going through hella shit. Like, obviously, I was injured at that point in time as well, going through my family stuff. And it happened to be her birthday that day, which mm -hmm. was crazy because it was just a regular day. Like that, if you ever watched the game, like it wasn't no game where I started out super hot, right. where I was hitting every shot. How I was scoring, how I was getting my getting off, it was just in the flow of the game. So when that happened and I started to get going late in the game, as you said, the crowd was going crazy, but like it was one of the weirdest moments of my life on the basketball court. It was one of the moments where I didn't hear shit. Like, it was like, I was on the court by myself. In the zone. In the zone. Like, I was in a space I'd never been in before. Like, I've scored 50 a few times in the league. I've scored 50, like, growing up a lot. But that, in that moment, which was my sister's birthday, it was game two of the NBA playoffs, which everybody was watching. That was one of the first times in my life, like, I was in one of them spaces where I didn't see nothing. I didn't see what was going on in the crowd. I, I felt like I was just in the gym by myself, just shooting back at the YMCA in Tacoma, Washington, doing shit I used to do when I was like 13, 14 years old. Yeah. Go getting, you know, shooting and going to get my own rebound, those type of workouts. Like, especially in the second half, every shot, like I was just going through the motions, getting to my spots knocking it down. Have you ever seen the movie Six Man? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it felt like that. It right. felt like my sister was just there, just every shot going in. She was just putting it in. Like every move going in, I'm just blowing by guys. Like not even doing even good moves, just they just letting me go by. It, it just felt like she was there helping me. Like I've been in the zone before, but not that zone. And it was like the best moment for not only myself, but for my family, like for my dad, that was a tough time in his life, losing his daughter. So when I was going through that, in my head, I was just smiling. If you watch the game, I don't show no emotion the whole game. I'm not even like, after big plays, I'm not even flexing, I'm not doing nothing. Cause it felt like I was out there by myself and I was just doing moves. I was just, just making shots like by myself and just running back down. Like when I usually go back home after good games, you know, you'd be hyped. You'd be like, your boys is calling you. It wasn't like I wasn't checking my phone or nothing. It was, it was like another day at the office. It was an amazing moment, but it was a tough moment as well. So like, I'm gonna always cherish that. That was a dope birthday gift for my sister. And it was like one of the best playoff performances like in NBA history. So it was, it was definitely a special moment. Shout out to Six Man, one of the best basketball yeah. movies ever. Six Man, yeah, that was, and it was at <laughs> the University of Washington. Yeah, so like, University that Washington. was something I was thinking of after the game. Like it felt like that movie. Yeah, it felt like yeah. It was, Shout out to my that. sister was just carrying me that night. Jalen Brown was a rookie that year, yeah. and um, we just watched him win Eastern Conference MVP, Finals MVP, win a championship, and just seeing how he evolved from that rookie year to the type of player defensively and offensively now. Just speak on him or what you've seen him as a rookie to what you see now. I'm not gonna lie, I didn't see this at all. But you've seen traits of him being great. He was always in the gym, he was always asking questions. I never really seen a rookie like really be asking questions on how to get better, how to do right things to get on the court. So he was always a student of the game. And he just worked. Like, he want to play one-on-one -on -one after practice. Like, he wanted to do all those things. So, And you've seen the skill set. You've seen it, but I, I would be lying to you if I said it down the line he was going to be finals MVP. Yeah. I, I didn't know that, but i seen how special he could be and how much of a student of the game he was. So I'm happy for Jalen because every year, if you see his career, every year he's gotten so much better. Yeah. He's added something to his game. And one thing I'm going to say about him that I knew – was gonna help him. From day one, he felt like he was the best player on the team. Mm -hmm. Like that's how he carried himself. No disrespect at all too. To he nobody. Felt, yeah. To nobody. He carried himself like he was and he, he would say that at times like, 
when I get my opportunity, y'all gonna see. So like, it's dope to see the success he's had in his career, the success of winning. That's definitely a, a, a young homie of mine that I talk to all the time. And I'm super proud of him for real, but I couldn't tell you that he was gonna be finals MVP in the future, all stars down the line, but I could tell you he had a chance and he's taking super advantage of it. So tell me this, you talked about like, even in the big game, you, you, you was injured already. Tell me when you first hurt your hip and then just walk me through how that whole, how everything played out <laughs> all the way to the trade of yeah. Kyrie and all that. Just tell me like when you knew you were hurt, what you were supposed to do or the doctor said. And so just look, so in March of that year, we playing the Minnesota Timberwolves. I, I, I go in the paint, take a layup, Carl Anthony Towns falls on me. I land really weird, he falls on me, like jerks my leg a little bit. But it's crazy because after that game, like I didn't even feel my hip at that point. I sprained my knee that play. So I think I sat out like two games. After that, I started to get some discomfort in my hip. But it was like, you know how it is. Like, you, like it's towards the end of the season. Some bruises, you, everybody Yeah, like, I wasn't thinking nothing of it. We took x-rays. As time goes on, I'm playing a little more. It's getting closer to the end of the season. I'm starting to feel a little more, like, just some discomfort. My, my hip's always been a little tight, as athletes' hips always mm -hmm. are. I don't feel anything at the start of the playoffs, obviously, because they shoot me up. So when they do that... I'm kind of good. Like, I, I'm able to start the playoffs. Yeah, mask all the pain. Yeah, yeah, I'm not in no pain. I'm cool. That's why I'm still serving, too. We go in the second round. I'm starting to feel a little more pain. And at this point, it's still a bone bruise. So, like, there isn't nothing else diagnosed. Bone yeah. You feel me? Yeah. It's just like, it can't get any worse. And that's what it was stated. Fast forward, that's what I was very upset about. Because nothing was like, if you tell me this can possibly get worse, this is what you have, then it's on me make choice. to make the choice. It was none of that stated. So I went in like, okay, I got a bone bruise. I can figure this out. Like I've done my whole life. Like I got a little bruise. I can figure this out. They shoot me up again to go into the Wizards series. I got shot up three times. Every, every round. Three times. The last one was right before game seven of the Wizards series. I play game seven. I cook, we win. Game one, of the Cleveland series, I played through it, but I could start to feel it. So if you watch game one, I'm definitely not myself. I can't even move that good. Game two, I remember I get hit by a screen and it just shoots to the back of my hip. And I'm like, what the? Like, I, I've, I've never felt this pain before. So we go into halftime, Danny Ainge and all of them are back there. The doctors are back there. They're like, you're done. Like, it's a wrap. Like, you, we gotta go to the doctor. We gotta figure this out. At that point, obviously I know something's wrong with my hip, but I'm still not thinking the worst shit ever. Right. So we go through that process. My, my, my season is over. Um, we end up losing to the Cavaliers. Then at that point, we go to the doctor in New York and we figure out like it's worse than it is. We figured out at that point in time, me playing through it and getting shot up. Made it worse. Made it way worse to the young guys that are watching don't do the cortisone because the cortisone takes away from your cartilage. That took away all of my cartilage that quick in two months. The doctor said that's the fastest I've ever seen cartilage go away. So that's what started everything, bone on bone. I get traded to Cleveland. I'm upset because at that point, I put my career on the line for something you could have just broke down to me and told me if you do play or if we do do this, it could possibly be what it happened to be. Like, I, I, it took me three years to get really get back to who I am and really, you know, figure out what was going on. But it was a tough situation. Like, it was a tough, it was a learning experience for myself. Like, I got real love for Boston and everybody in that organization. It was definitely the wrong way to go about things. Not to blame, I'm not blaming Boston. I'm not blaming those guys. People know what happened, it's documented. So I'm not saying nothing that yeah. this putting anybody on blast. It was just a messed up situation I, and it happened to be with me. And it, it sucks because so much was on the line. If I got all NBA that following year, I'm a, I'm a super max guy. Like I'm eligible for the super max. So all of that is in play. When you look at it like that, that shit sucks.
But at the end of the day, you live and you learn, you make mistakes, you make decisions. I got no hard feelings. Like at that point, that 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 hurt because I put my career on the line. Yeah. And then you trade me too. Mm -hmm. I understand the business of the game. I was never fighting that. Like, oh, I got traded, I'm mad at that. It was how it happened. I'm a franchise guy at that point. So as you guys know, it should have been communicated. Yeah. This is what possibly can happen. I'm the franchise for the Boston Celtics at that point. But like, you live and you learn, you move past it. I'm healthy again, I'm, I'm cool. Like, I got no pain no more, but I, I, I went through obviously real life shit with my sister, getting traded, getting hurt. Yeah, that was an like, emotional was, year. Yeah, it was. Before that happened. And especially that year. I always say that was the best year of my career and the worst year of my life yeah. at the same time. Like, let that sink in. Like, my, lost my sister, almost had career ending injury, lost out on some big bread, which like at the end of the day, no, I never a... had it. So I can't say like, we can only speculate what could have happened. And then as you guys seen, as the world seen, like my career started to do this. My opportunities started to go down. I'm fighting through injury. I'm fighting to, to showcase I still got it when I'm really hurt. Right. Like, so it was, a, it was a tough situation, but at the end of the day, I came out with a smile on my face. Now, I respect that you're, you know, not, you're not bitter, bro. Like, I'm you, not, because I was at one point. You had, we all be For two to three years, point. it you was go like, through it. That's part of I was the at the crib, mad at my wife. Mad at the world, a mad, mad rapper at my kids, looking at who's like, like, he whack. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, really mad. That was like the first time in my life, like, I was mad at the game of basketball, too. Yeah. Because this is the first time in your life that you felt like, since probably like five years old, like you been a hawk, a clipper, or whatever that team was. Just like I'm telling you, because we all went through it when we they it. make when the game and, it, and when it, when it's not on your terms, when you didn't ah, make that choice. Yes. You, like you said, you sitting at home the mad rapper. When I got first got let go by the Magic, I said after I'm thinking like, yeah, cool. I'm about to what? I'm about to get a double dip. Like I'm That's about to do I'm this. Saying. What I'm thinking? I'm like, my agent gonna call me in another day or so. Like. Yep. I don't know ring, then when he nah. ring, he ain't saying what you want to hear. You oh, like the not fuck? at all. Time went by. And, and like you say, you become the mad rapper. You, you be the mad dude. Hot at everything. But that's right? why I say I got respect that you, you know, we all got to fight through that. But as long as we get through it and to see you, you know what I'm saying? Like what right I see now. on social yeah. media, wherever I see, like like you said, you, you come through with a smile on your face. And yep. we could see the genuine, you know, it's mm -hmm. genuine whether if it wasn't or not. But yeah. like, I appreciate that, that you came through and you still, you still you. You happy, you good, and you got a positive outlook. And on you it. know what? It, it was like, it was a lot of soul searching at that point, too. As you guys know, like, that was the toughest stretch of my life because I never been through an injury, really. I never been through, at that point, like, the world was watching me every day. Mm -hmm. The world, like, yeah. when I would go out to perform, I just came off averaging 30. So I get traded to a team with LeBron James, and I'm not myself at five foot nine. Yeah. It's damn near impossible. Like it was, it was just a tough situation. But like you said, I came out on top. I came out with a smile on my face. I'm super blessed. I'm still able to play the game I love. I'm still trying to play a year or two more. Um, and that's just what it is. I'm happy to be in the position I am today. Like I'm able to not only inspire people, especially the younger generation, but I'm able to tell my story because yeah, like yeah. I tell these kids, most of you kids are gonna be me. Yeah. where you're going to have to fight every day. You're going to have to fight every season. If you did good, you're going to have to do more. If you did great, you're going to have to be better. So, like, I'm cool with being that guy because yeah. I know a lot of these young kids look at look to me for that and look to me for inspiration. And that's what, you know, that's what I got to do, and I'm I'm happy with that. Yeah, that's why we tell these stories so the next generation will know or, or seen it before. I wanted to ask when you was with Cleveland, did you have did you have to make a choice of whether to have surgery or just rehab? The surgery I got in 2020 was the first option in 17. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to be the first athlete to get it. Mm -hmm. So I I was gonna be the guinea pig of getting it. And I'm like, I'm not about to do that. It's major surgery. The the surgeon gave me this option. He said it would change everything, but nobody has done it. Like Regular people have done it, but an athlete hasn't done it. And then they said there's an option of rehabbing. Like there's a chance you could come back and it can it'll take a minute, but you can rehab it. You right. can rehab it. So I I decided and the team decided that was the best decision to make. 
to rehab, to take time off. So I took that whole summer off of rehabbing. I didn't play that season till January. So I took, I took a, like six or seven months off. Came back, I just wasn't myself. Every opportunity I got, whether when I got traded to Cleveland, halfway through that, I got traded to the Lakers. I ended up getting a, a small clean out surgery. They were probably made my shit worse when I got to the Lakers. Next year, I went to Denver, rehab that. Didn't really get the chance, but I wasn't myself, so I understand me not getting the chance that I thought I deserved. Yeah. The next year, went to the Wizards. They gave me a chance. I started, averaged 13 and five. We wasn't that good, but I wasn't myself. Like you could see, I was dragging my leg and all that. So the blessing in disguise came in the pandemic, when you know the world stopped. Mm -hmm. I end up going back to that surgeon, called him. And the biggest reason why I didn't have that surgery was because I didn't have the time to sit out. Mm -hmm. But fast forward to 2020, I go back to that surgeon, get that hip surgery, resurfacing of my hip. I got seven to nine months because the NBA stopped. Right. Seven to nine months to rehab, rehabbed every day, got back. I've never felt any better. Like it was a blessing in disguise. Like I, I thank Dr. Sue, which was my surgeon in New York City. I thank him probably every couple months. As a 60th pick, right, you got a chance to get a bag a little earlier than the rest of yeah. the guys. So, you you know, tell me what you did to make yourself feel good when you, when you, how did you reward yourself? I was a 60th pick, so my money wasn't coming in right. great. Like, obviously, it was more money I ever made in my life. I had kids as well. I had a family. So when I got that deal, the first thing I did for anybody, I bought my mama a house, I bought my pops a little car he always wanted. I took care of my parents and I bought me a house. That was that was that was what I did. Out of all the teams you played with in the NBA, if you had to pick four other players to make your ultimate five, what would be your ultimate five? Me at the one, KD at the two, LeBron at the three, mm. Anthony Davis at the four, Joker at the five. I played in Denver. Joker over the Marcus Cousins. I got to, he back to back, he two time MVP. I always give DeMarcus his flowers cause he started what them bigs are doing now. Yeah. Like in terms of having yeah, handle, handle he can shoot, he can do a little bit of everything. Yeah. Like I hope them bigs give him a little bit of flowers for starting that little wave of, of bigs. But yeah, that's, that's my five. All right, man, that's a wrap, man. From Eight Lounge Inside Resorts World, Las Vegas, man. We got Slow Grind in the slow building, grind. man. We you appreciate you, young fella. I gotta fella. do this one time. Yes, sir. We Cause appreciate. I used to do this in high school. That's what's crazy. <laughs> yes, sir. You yes, know? sir. We Full appreciate Full circle moment, man. Full circle. I appreciate y'all being a big part of the culture in, you know, in the, in the game of basketball. And I'm always giving my flowers to, to the guys who did it before me. So yeah, I appreciate, appreciate it, bro.